professor Gordon Laffer, que é o nosso painelista do ciclo de seminários em estudos globais do trabalho. O professor Gordon Laffer é professor de educação para o trabalho, é o diretor é, do Centro de Educação do Trabalho e Pesquisa Social da Universidade de Oregon e vai fazer a apresentação sobre o ataque às, aos sindicatos docentes e a resposta estratégica dos sindicatos nos Estados Unidos da América. Eu não vou estar na Santa Bárbara, sou parte aqui do Centro de Estudos Globais. E agora, a ideia é de ter uma apresentação sobre o tema, e depois, talvez, algum Q&A, e podemos conversar. Is that okay? Great. So, professor. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for the invitation to be here, and especially to Professor Del Santa for your kind introduction uh, and invitation. I um, apologize, I can't give the lecture in Portuguese, but if anything is not clear, please stop me. I'm happy to answer questions. So, um, I know that there's been a, a big and important fight by teachers unions here in Portugal this year, and it's something that many people in many places, including in America, are looking at to learn from. And I think that our, I want to talk today about our experience in the U.S. also, and hopefully there's something there that also will be relevant and can be learned from. So I would say uh, in many places of the world, we're in a fight now between two different models of what education should look like. This is not for university so much, but primary and secondary education. That roughly is the model of Finland and the model that is increasingly common in the US. And the difference between these is very dramatic in the differences between having a small number of kids in each class or large classes between having teachers who are well, highly paid and experienced or low paid and inexperienced, having lessons, the idea that a teacher is like a professional pedagogue who will make up their own lessons based on what they know and what they think is best for their kids, versus the idea that lessons are a standard product created by an outside company and the teachers just follow the rules to, to deliver the lessons and every teacher should be doing the same thing. Um, also, the difference between how education is measured, is it measured by the judgment of teachers in, in grades, or is it measured by standardized tests? And how broad is the subjects that you learn in school? In, the, in one model, it's very broad, include art and drama and philosophy and social studies. And the other one, it's very narrow, more and more only reading and math. Um, and finally, the last big difference is that um, the idea that, at one model, the idea that teaching is inherently relational and happens in a relationship between teacher and student, and so a lot of it is focused on discussion. And the other is the idea that teaching is just students mastering facts and competencies, and this can be this can happen online in digital applications as or in large classes, and doesn't have to be in small discussions. Uh, basically, every parent prefers the Finnish model for their kid. And there's, there's 50 or 100 years of research showing that this is the superior model for education. But there's also a very quick way to see that this is the better model, which is to look where do rich people send their kids to school. When rich people send their kids to elite private schools, they all look like Finland. Nobody says, I want my kid to be in a class with 35 kids taught by an inexperienced teacher on a video game based app. So then the question is, if everybody wants the Finnish model, how come more and more in the US but other places too were being pushed towards this other model? And oops, let's go forward. So there, you know, in education like everything, it's there are multiple causes. But there are three main uh, forces that are pushing education in this direction. One is uh, big business corporations that don't want to pay taxes, and so they always want to make taxes less. Education is a big part of the government budget, so they just want to cut, they want to cut education because they want to pay less taxes. 
A second is right-wing politicians who see unions as their political enemy and they want to get rid of the power of teachers and teachers' unions because they think it's a political enemy. And the third is the least obvious but actually the most powerful, and I want to spend a little time explaining it, which is a combination of the finance industry, banks, investment banks, private investment, and the big technology companies who see that there is a ton of money, huge profit to be made by replacing in-person education with digital education. So, um, let me talk about this a little bit. When people talk about the education technology industry, so what this is, I, I could say at least in the US, is all of the biggest banks in the country, every major bank on, on Wall Street and probably internationally, since 15 years, 12, 15 years, has a special division just for investment in primary and secondary education market. And all of the biggest technology companies are in this market. The way they look at it, this is a, a quote from one conference. There are multiple conferences a year where you have a conference, and who's in the conference is education policymakers from the government, big banks, technology companies, and little startup entrepreneurs who say, I have I have an app for teaching 10-year-olds algebra, or whatever. Somebody fund me, right? These conferences happen, several of them, every year. And so one of them recently, basically they say, they look at education and say this is a huge amount of money going through the economy every year and we don't have a piece of it, or we don't have a big enough piece. We meaning the banks, the investors, and the technology company. And so they're trying to figure out how, do we, how can we get more of this for ourselves? Um, the, the reason it's so profitable is for a few things. This is Reed Hastings, the head of Netflix, who now is a major investor in education technology. And he says what we all know, like we have finally arrived technologically at a point where after you produce the first model of something, it costs basically nothing to produce the next million uh, songs or movies or anything digital, including education products. He says it's so profitable because you produce once and consume many times. So sometimes this happens by political power. So the kinds of things that happen is they'll say, well, there's a really smart kid in a high school and he wants to study biochemistry. And there is no biochemistry class in his high school. Shouldn't he be able to take a class someplace else. So yes, yes, yes. Okay. And that school is a that class is an online class. Okay. So now how much should that online class get in money for this kid? And in most of the US the way the law works is they say if a student has seven classes and this biochemistry is one of those seven classes, then the company that provides that class should get one seventh of the funding for that student. So in other words, they get the same uh, dollars or euros per student for a digital class as for a physical existing class in a building with a teacher. Some places the politics is not quite as strong and they get 80% or 90%, but um, the profit margins are enormous. Um, one of the other things that happens is that uh, in when banks or private companies look to invest, usually the higher interest rate that you can earn, the more money you can earn, the more risky an investment is. So if someone wants to invest in something with high risk, they'll get a high rate of return. The safest thing, usually the safest thing somebody can invest in is government bonds, which pay a very, very low interest rate. Education is the unusual situation where the profit rate is very high, but it's completely safe because it's like buying government debt. Unless the whole government collapses, they're going to fund the schools year after year after year. There's no risk. So they say this is guaranteed money at a high profit rate, which is almost impossible to find. The, um, I don't know, is venture capital, you know what venture capital is, I don't know if it's very way it's difficult to translate capitalists. Uh, 
So anyway, it's like private investors, not on the stock market. Investors in risk. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is a big part of this market. Now, in that industry, a good product earns 15% profit per year. So where do these products come from? Somebody says, I have an application to teach geometry to 13-year-olds or whatever. They don't come from teachers. They don't come from parents. They come from a company whose first question is, how can I make at least 15% profit from this? And then within that, if it will help kids learn, okay, all the better. But the first test of creating a product is to try to earn this very high rate of return. So this is why all of the banks are in here. And this is why if you, if you talk to friends who are teachers or education professors or anything and you say, how, how can we help kids who need more help? It's not obvious that the answer would be technology. Oh, we need one-on-one -on -one tutors. Maybe we should get uh, old people who are retired to come in and sit with kids and help them read. Maybe we should help teach the parents how to help their kids. I don't know. There's a lot of different things, but the, all of the attention is on technology, and the reason is not because there is any evidence that it's better, but because it makes so much money, and therefore there's a lot of political power behind it, because all of the big banks and all of the big technology companies are also politically powerful, and they're pushing. This is the most important force that is pushing us in this direction. Um, this is from another conference. One of them says, the key question is, how do we use technology so that we require fewer qualified teachers? Right, so the, the number one thing they need is they need a standard product to get a mass market. So for them, the worst thing is the idea that each professor or each teacher comes up with their own way of teaching some subject matter. And you can think, I don't know exactly what you guys teach in global studies, I can imagine, but if you're teaching the history of Portugal and a company would come to you and say, don't, we don't want you to think about it anymore. We have the app. Here's the best way to teach. Here's what you do in the first week. Here's what you do in the second week. We don't want you to make anything up, right? Because when you make something up, it means there's not a standard product and there's not a mass market anymore. So this changes, um, it changes the very idea of what does it mean to teach and what does it mean to learn. In order to have standard products, it says, you know, what is education? Education is what we can measure. Because the way these products get marketed is by saying this increased the test scores by 3% or whatever. Right? So the test scores, standardized tests are like the, the marketing system or the accounting system that makes this market possible. So then the only thing that we test, or the, only, the thing that we teach and the idea um, and you see this not only with digital products, but more and more teachers get told, you need to define your objective, and what are the pieces of evidence that will show if your students have met your objective, and which pieces of evidence will happen in this day, and this week, and this day, and this week, that everything becomes proving that students either memorized some facts, or learned some competency that is measurable. Now, all of us can think of, um, I don't know. I bet if you think of what was the best class you ever took and what was best about what made it good, a lot of those things are not measurable. Kids who are weird daydreamers have imagination or learn how to make friends or learn how to be brave and speak up or, you know, all kinds of things are not measured by electronic tests. But so more and more the idea of education becomes what we can measure, meaning what we can measure by standard electronic tests. Um, this, of course, learning facts can be done online. It can be done in large classes. And the role of a teacher becomes not a pedagogical expert, but a content deliverer, right? which is also what makes it possible for these to be low-wage, high-turnover jobs. If I say, okay, I'll take some uh, kid who's 
you know, 21. I'll put them in the classroom. I'll tell them exactly what to do. They'll get burnt out after three years. No problem. I get, in, I get the next 21-year-old. If this is the model of education, it's okay. You don't, and by, so this means that the teaching as a profession becomes deprofessionalized. And the idea that part of what teachers are is intellectuals who need um, academic freedom, who need the intellectual freedom to decide how am I going to teach is no longer, no longer makes sense because now we have people who are supposed to be delivering standard content. And I would say the direction that we're moving in the U.S. is a direction that um, rich people's kids will still be taught like in Finland, but more and more of, of poor working class, middle class people, will, their kids will get an education like this. They, I don't know if you've gotten this in Portugal, but the latest thing in the last couple of years is a strong emphasis on the idea that there is a science of learning to read for little kids. And um, what this is being used for is to say there is one right way to teach reading to all human beings. And they have, you can see these kind of graphs of, of um, here's the brain. Sorry, should I make this? You know, here's the brain, and this this thing reminds me of um, those things from the 19th century when you had maps of people's uh, phrenology. Right. Phrenology, yes. Yeah, same. Right. That it was supposedly a science that you could tell what somebody was like by feeling the lumps in their head, and they had maps that looked like that. Um, I'm sure there is science to reading. But there's science to a lot of things, like there's science to playing football. There's probably more science to being good at football than there is the science of learning to read. But we don't say it doesn't matter who the coach is in football. And you, you just have one thing, as long as they do everything, then every player will be excellent because it's a mechanical kind of science. But the push to go in this direction is the push to do all of these things, to make teachers to the, the companies talk sometimes about having a curriculum that is teacher-proof, which means you can have a bad teacher, a good teacher, it doesn't matter, it will all roll out the same. So, so this is, even without the digital thing, is a push towards saying we want to think of, of education as a standard thing that everybody should be doing the same thing. Um, I'll say, Okay, I'm going to skip that. I'll just say briefly, um, you know, when we look at the big companies in the U.S., big multinational corporations who are pushing this agenda, sometimes people ask, um, isn't it, don't they want well-educated students because that's who are going to become their workers and they need well-educated workers and don't they need people who will make a lot of money to buy their products? So they need people well-educated. Like, isn't it against their own interests to lower the quality of education? And this is a long discussion, but I would say in America, for most of these companies, um, more and more of their money is made any place in the world. The work is done by whoever is the cheapest and the most politically repressed in the world. And they see a lot of the local population they, they see what everybody sees, the U.S. as an empire in decline, and they, th they think most people are um, superfluous. Not most, but a lot of people are superfluous. They're not needed as workers, they're not needed as consumers, they're not needed as taxpayers, and they think if you're going to have a lot of people who are downwardly mobile, the last thing you want is for them to be well-educated, because then they feel entitled to something, and they might have the skills to do something about it. This quote is from 50 years ago, from an advisor to President Nixon. And at that time, they were talking about um, university education, not primary or secondary. And they said, we are in danger of producing an educated proletariat. We have to be selective about who we allow to go through higher education in university. If not, we will have a large number of highly trained and unemployed people. So when we, th when we have to think at some point that the big corporate organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, not just, into, not just the technology companies, are pushing education in this direction, 
is partly because they don't believe that they need most people to be highly educated. Where they need people, they can do kind of targeted interventions. I know this is a depressing talk, but it gets better. So um, the, the current uh, wave of attacks on teachers and education started around 2010. I can explain later why. But the focus then um, was a big public attack. And, and this, was, um, this was just after the, the world economic crisis of 2008 and 9, And the government really honestly had a budget crisis. And the attack on teachers said two things. One, teachers make too much money, they're selfish, and it's not right that poor and working class people pay taxes so the teachers can live better than them. And so they always try to divide you know, the population from the teachers. And the second is that labor unions protect bad teachers and make it impossible to fire people who should be fired. So this is a, one of the national magazines said, the key to saving American education, we must fire bad teachers. Um, this was in uh, Times Square in New York City. They had a big competition online to vote for the worst teacher you ever had who was in a union and couldn't be fired. Right? So it just tried to make everybody think all, all the time about the teachers you hated and how bad it is that there's a union that they can't be fired. Um, and also that we should have standard products to make sure that bad teachers can't sabotage education because they'll be forced to do the same thing as everybody else. So this was the, um, you know, based on, as part of that attack, this map shows almost half of the states in the U.S. just in two years passed laws um, either destroying, outlawing teachers' unions, restricting what they could bargain for, or taking away their rights. So this is kind of the background. This is the, the problem that teachers and teachers' unions confronted. Uh, where things started to change, uh, the, the most important turning place was the strike of teachers in Chicago in 2012. And this was the first time Teachers went on strike. Of course, they were striking for more money, but they also struck for these questions of education quality. So this is a list of things that they won in this strike. They said, we need more music and art teachers. PE is like athletics, physical education, more social workers and nurses. Chicago is a poor city, and there were schools where um, school started September 1st, and kids didn't get their books until October 15th. So you wouldn't think they would have to strike in order to get books on the first day of school, but they did, and this was one of their demands. And also to keep class sizes small, capped at a certain number. So all of these are things that are not, not about the salary and benefits of the teachers. And this marked a, a radical change in the union, how the union operated and in their strategy. Until this time, um, teachers complained all the time. I have too many kids in my class. My kids don't get their books. We don't have science equipment. We don't have aids for kids with special needs. And what the union said is, yeah, that, that sucks. That's terrible. But that's not what we do. What we do is we negotiate salaries and benefits. And so the union thought, yeah, this was a tragedy, but not part of its job. Until this Chicago strike, and they said, we need to be we need to be striking for to defend the quality of education. The other thing that was new in the Chicago strike is that until this time, if you ask teachers, tell me what's bad about the schools, everyone could talk forever. If you said, what is our vision of how the schools should work? If we were in charge of the schools, how would we do things? Nobody could answer that question, not individually and not the union as an organization. So in Chicago, there was a, a um, left-wing organization within the union that won election and took over the union. They were opposed by the national leadership, and they especially were discouraged from striking because uh, President Obama was president then, and Chicago is his hometown. They said, you'll embarrass the president in his hometown. Don't go on strike. So the first thing they did when they took over the union is they spent a year having hundreds and hundreds of conversations with teachers to answer this question, how should things work? 
and they produced this document called The Schools Chicago Students Deserve that was, here is our positive vision about what our students deserve. And then they struck over that. So it was, it was both a turning point for the union in that they said it's our responsibility not only to negotiate money, but also quality of education, and that we have a vision. We can tell you what do we think the schools should be like. Now, um, I think I missed something. Okay, one of the slide. What they, part of their strategic calculation was they would win the strike or lose the strike based on public support. It's not like some, you know, if, you, if your job is to manufacture automobiles and you strike, you cost the company millions of euros from day one. Um, when teachers strike, there's a lot of power in it. It disrupts parents' lives where people can't go to work, they don't know what to do with their kids. Um, but it doesn't have the same economic effect. And the disrupting the lives of parents goes both ways. On the, it might make the parents say to the government, give the teachers what they want so my kid can go back at school. Or it might make the parents angry at the teachers and say, stop ruining my life by being on strike. So they said, we're going to win or lose based on the, the politics of this. And to do this, we need to get the parents and the community leaders on our side. So in every school, they had one teacher, a volunteer, whose job was to organize the other teachers, and a second teacher whose job was to organize the parents and the community leaders. And Chicago roughly is one-third black, one-third white, one-third Mexican. And they thought, more or less, the union thought that the white communities would side with the government against the union, the Mexican community would side with the union, and the black community was split. So in schools that were in black neighborhoods, they had extra teachers as volunteers and said, we need to talk to every church, we need to talk to every community organization, we need to talk to every, every parents group, every sports group. And when we talked to them, they thought, if we go to them and say, teachers deserve fair salaries, please support us, they'll get some support, but not enough to win. If they go to them and said, our kids deserve smaller classes and books on the first day and social workers and nurses and things like that, that that was the thing that would build community support and could let them win where otherwise they would lose. So in Chicago they were on strike for about 10 days and won. They didn't win everything, but they won all those things I showed you. And then after that, not, not every union, but more and more unions started to follow this model. So, uh, one of the things, one of the next steps that happened starting the next year is there were unions in, uh, this is in Wisconsin and Minnesota, where everybody started making up their documents. Like the schools, Lisbon's children deserve. The schools, Pittsburgh's children deserve. But in this case, they did this not only by talking to hundreds of teachers, but also by talking to parents and priests and community leaders, and having those people help make up the recommendations. Now, only the union has the legal authority to negotiate, and only the teachers would vote on whether they accept a contract or not. But they had proposals that were made up by community members also. How big should the classes be? Um, you know, do we need enough buses to guarantee that every kid can go to school in 20 minutes? I don't know, a lot, a lot of different things. Um, when they walked, so first they had to decide. They demanded much bigger rooms for negotiations. Employers always want to have negotiations in secret, in a small room with very few people. So this is a, a picture in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they said, we need to have negotiations in a big, big room because we have a lot of people from the community who will come. It also requires, so when, when they came into negotiations, physically, how negotiations looked is you have a table, and on this side of the table is the union, and parents, and priests, and community leaders, and on the other side is the employer. So both in making up their proposals and in the physical, um, physically, how negotiations happened, it was taking, all the attack on teachers was always trying to turn parents against teachers. Right? You're making our kids stay home, you're making our taxes go up, 
you're making my kid have a crappy teacher who can't be fired, and turn that around to put the parents and the community on the side of the union. Right? And then they would make proposals, and some of these proposals came from parents, and the parents would see, management would see the employer say, no, 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 that's impossible, it would be dismissive. So, now this also required um, non-defensiveness from the leaders of the union. It's leaders of the union very often get panicked that they're going to lose or that somebody will replace them in elections, and it makes them want to control everything and feel like, I don't want any community people here, I don't want to open this up, I need to be able to control this. If I tell people what I'm asking for and I don't get it, I seem like a loser and I won't get reelected to be president. There's a, a lot of, it's not nothing and it's not because of corruption. But so all, in all these cases, it required a radical change of the union and a kind of openness from the leadership. But there were a series of big strikes over the next decade leading up until the pandemic, until COVID. And all of the big strikes followed the same model. They all, they all wanted money, of course, but they also struck for smaller classes, science and computer equipment, more counselors. They started even to expand what were the things they would bargain for. So one of the things in, um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a poor city, the teachers bargained for um, legalization of marijuana, which you would think, what? You know, okay, I think that's a good thing, but why would the teachers bargain for this? And they said, like, it's a poor city, and we have so many kids who them or their brothers and sisters are going into prison and being arrested by the police, and it destroys their lives, and it destroys their families. We need to, this should be legal, and we need to do this for our students. In, um, I don't have this here, but in Los Angeles, teachers went on strike in 2019, President Trump was president, and there was, Los Angeles, there's many, many, many uh, undocumented immigrants from Central America, and they were afraid, it could, because it was happening, that the police would come, a kid goes to school, they come home, no parents, the parents were deported. So the teachers negotiated and got the school district to hire three full-time lawyers whose job would be to help the families of students who are undocumented to protect them against being deported. So also their idea of, of what is our responsibility as teachers um, kind of fit what the teachers themselves felt, which is most teachers feel like I make less money than I could at something else, but I'm, I have a connection to these kids and I want to take care of them. So uh, this, this did not transfer. Um, but basically what this shows is public opinion polls in 2020 when asked people what is the biggest problem in education. If you remember, 10 years before this, they were saying the biggest problem is bad teachers and how can we fire bad teachers? Now with that big purple line is, is them saying, how do we hire and keep more good teachers? So they're focused more on developing and paying enough and treating like professionals good teachers to keep them. So, since this time, I don't want to tell the story as if it's all, you know, victory and, and beautiful. There have been defeats and um, a lot of hardship and a lot of unions whose leaders were not willing to make this change. But, um, but to us, the lesson is clear, at least, that this is the direction to go in. The other side will always try to focus on political issues that split parents from teachers, if it's immigration or sex or racism or uh, something else. And that the way for education unions to be successful is to keep focused on the things that are about quality of education and that, and that make an alliance so it's not only teachers fighting for themselves, but that they have a much bigger um, support group with them. So uh, let me stop here.